Well, hello, folks. This is our first online lecture for our hybrid class, an, an introduction to women writers, uh, the American experience. Dr. Litton here. This is for our fall uh, 2021 course. You'll see that I'm recording this at home, and I'm wearing my tuxedo t-shirt just for the occasion. How about that? Yeah, you didn't think I had one, but I know how to go formal. Um, so we're going to be trying to uh, do several things in this, and my apologies are right off the bat. I may have to divide this into two videos. Sometimes it just uploads better if I've got two shorter videos than one really long one. So I may split this in half. We'll just see how long it runs, okay? I'm going to play a little catch-up and cover very, very briefly a couple of points concerning uh, Bradford's, um, I mean, sorry, Anne Bradstreet's poem, Here Follows Some Verses Upon the Burning of Our House, July 10th, 1666. Not the most lyrically titled poem, uh, but uh, just want to raise a couple points because we didn't get to it in class. Then we're going to cover Mary Rowlandson's captivity narrative, a very important, very fascinating piece um, that I hope you got all the way through. It does take some, some diligence to get there. And we're going to get around to one poem by Phyllis Wheatley, probably her most famous poem, and a controversial one in some ways. I don't know how you're going to feel about it, but we'll see, okay? So let's get started with um, uh, kind of tying up some uh, some uh, loose ends regarding Anne Bradstreet and her poem, uh, Here Follows. I will abbreviate it and shorten it for you. Um, there, of course, there's this strong belief, because she's a Puritan, in providence. Now, maybe you don't know what providence is, or you've kind of heard the term, and you kind of don't understand the concept that much. This is important both for Bradstreet and for Rowlandson, as we'll get to in a few minutes. It's the notion that everything that happens in your life happens for a reason, but it's more specific than that for a Puritan uh, or a very devout Christian person. It's not terribly difficult, different from maybe the Muslim notion of, of uh, God's uh, uh, intervention in our lives, but it's the idea that everything happens to you for a reason, and that reason is God-directed. And also the idea that everything in life, in on earth happens because God intervenes directly into the affairs of individuals. Um, so the idea that, you know, something happened to me this morning, I, I stubbed my toe, why is that? Well, a Puritan might say, well, I don't know, I got to think about that. Um, maybe I stubbed my toe because God is trying to send me some sort of metaphorical message about how there's something in my life that is self-destructive and I'm, I'm hurting myself. Maybe I drink too much or smoke or, you know, don't exercise or I eat too much Taco Bell. Um, and uh, I need to do something about it. You and I would just say, hey, I just stumped my toe. Um, but uh, Or a person with a purely secular outlook would not look at that kind of event and say anything of it. However, a lot of us do look at big events that happen to us and say, well, we think, we wonder whether that was a God thing, um, particularly if you're a person of faith, whatever that faith happens to be. You know, something happens to you like you're saved from a plane crash. Why did that happen? Why did God spare me? Why was I spared? Is there something I'm supposed to be doing with my so that's just a normal human tendency. Of course it is. And particularly for someone who's a religious believer like Anne Bradstreet, that would not be the least bit unusual. So when bad things happen, we seek explanations. This is not unusual. You'll see this in Rowlandson. That's why I've got these two paired up. Um, so um, her house burned down. It's terrible. Um, no one wants that to happen. Guess what they didn't have in 1666 that we have? Insurance. Uh, so when you lost your house, you lost your home, you lost everything in it. Ask anybody who suffered a devastating loss like that, even with insurance, it leaves a deep, deep devastating scar. Why? Because your house is kind of a repository of all of the things that you have, but also think about all the other stuff, all of the precious things that are irreplaceable. You know, pictures sometimes, uh, whether they're printed or on your computer, you, you, you lose them if you don't back them up. Um, things your mother or your grandmother gave you. Um, things that are family heirlooms. Things that have sentimental but not terribly material value to you. You know, your letter jacket when you were in school or um, your dad's, you know, jacket from when he was in the army or, um, you know, some, some, some sort of painting that your grandmother made and uh, things of this nature, um, that it's all gone, you see, and re even insurance can't replace that. Imagine a world in which a woman's home is just destroyed and everything in it is destroyed. Very little is salvaged. So it becomes a repository. She also notes that it's a gathering place, uh, a place where memories are made, where families gather. You and I gather for 
Christmas. Puritans didn't believe in Christmas. Yes, that's why we kind of think they're rather stuffy. They didn't believe in Christmas. They didn't celebrate Christmas, but they celebrated other things, uh, obviously. And the other thing, too, is this, is that weddings did not take place in churches back then. Um, that's a fairly new phenomenon, frankly. It's in the last 100, 120 years. That's when people had church weddings. Most weddings took place in, in people's homes, in their living rooms. And that certainly would be the case with Puritans who, who saw um, weddings or marriages as being largely a secular affair, but because they were um, sacred covenants, they, they you know they, they were they were blessed by God and encouraged by God, but but uh, a gathering place. And then there's this concept that 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 a, a home was particularly the domain of a woman. Now, uh, you know, we don't have such strict um, sort of division of of gender labor the way they did back then. Today, you know, the ideal for most of us is that men and women work both inside and outside the home. They share those responsibilities and they overlap and you just, you know, we, we have a very different view. But at the time, 400 years ago, the notion was that a man's place was outside the home. He, he conducting business or farming or whatever it is. And, and inside the home, that was the woman's realm or her sphere, sphere of influence, right? That her world world was, was encompassed and symbolized by the home, right? This is where she raised her children. This is where she called the shots in some ways, right? She was the manager of the household. And it's gone, right? It's just totally taken from her. Um, it, it would be maybe the equivalent of a man losing his job, losing his business, and losing his ability to make a living, temporarily until he rebuilt himself. It's psychologically quite devastating. We see this strong notion of providence to kind of recap um, up on page nine, where she says, the flame consumed my dwelling place. And when I could no longer look, I blessed his name that gave and took, that laid my goods now in the dust. Yea, so it was, and so twas just. It was his own. It was not mine. So she has this view that you know, there's this inner turmoil that I, I I feel terrible, but she consoles herself with her religious conviction that this was not really my property. It belonged to God. It did not belong to me. I was just simply the temporary custodian of it. But gee, it still hurts to lose it. Um, she's being very human here, right? So so she doesn't want to be blasphemous or, or say anything against her, her views. She's maintaining her religious views, but she's also being very human and saying, this is painful to lose this. But she says, uh, when I could no longer look, I blessed his name. No, no, no. I'm not going to get bitter. I'm not going to get angry at God for, for this happening to me. Although she knows it happens for a reason. What that reason is, she can't figure it out. We're going to see that in Rollinson too. So stay tuned with that. Um, uh, the, 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 the God that laid my goods now in the dust, right? She, she, she understands. She says to herself, look, this is something God did. I don't know why, but it did, but he did. Um, yea, it was, so it was, and so twas just. How does she know it's just that she lost her home and all her possessions? She doesn't know why it's just. She just knows that if a just God did it, it is just. She doesn't understand the reason, but she trusts that God will reveal that at some point in the future. Um, you know, a little bit further down uh, in the poem, she says, My pleasant things and ashes lie. You can see the pain in her in her voice. But she says, oh, gosh, I lost all of that, all of those memories. I lost it all. But she says, you know what? God's teaching me a lesson. Don't cling to those things. They're not eternal. Everything in this world passes away. And maybe he's trying to teach me a very hard lesson, but I need to know it, which is don't put your faith in stuff. Don't put your love in stuff. Don't invest in stuff. Invest in relationships, in love, in in your spiritual development, not your stuff. She says, my pleasant things in ashes lie, and then behold, no more shall I. Under thy roof no guest shall sit, nor at thy table eat a bit. No pleasant talk shall e'er be told, nor things con recounted done of old. No candle ever shall shine in thee, nor bridegroom's voice Heard shall be. Remember, I told you that people got married in homes, and of course, 
think about this, your kitchen or wherever you hang out in your house. All the fun stuff your friends do, they come over, all those fun, happy times, you know, playing board games, sitting around watching a, a, a movie or um, just chatting and, you know, catching up with old times and all your friends. And, you know, maybe, you know, for them, it was around the hearth or the the um the the fireplace right this is what this is the room where all of those wonderful memories took place um and all of the future memories that won't take place there weddings and birthdays and all of those all of those things she, i mean you know i think i don't, I don't mean to be sexist about it but i do think a lot of men don't see the home the way women do and i think this is a real illustration of that um, we guys, some of us anyway, not all of us, um, kind of look at a home as a place to live. Um, but a lot of women, a lot of women, and especially at that time, view the home as this real emblem or symbol of the collection of all the experiences of their lives. And so as, as a metaphor for her past and for what isn't going to happen there in her future, it's quite it's quite a striking thing for her to illustrate all that out for us. At the end of the poem, the last lines, she says, There's wealth enough, I need no more. Farewell, my pelf, meaning my stuff. Farewell, my store. The world no longer let me love. My hope and treasure lies above. So her consolation is, look, I was going to lose it anyway. Right? You don't keep it with you forever. Uh, don't put your treasure in this. So there's a kind of stoic attitude here, a kind of resilient attitude. But what I love about the poem is that there are two emotional strains going on at the same time. One is this, oh, I lost all this. And you can't help but be sad. You know, I'm sure she probably beat herself up by saying, I shouldn't feel guilty about this because my religious views teach me don't put your faith in things. They're not here forever. Come on, it's only stuff. You can't take it with you. All of that, right? But it's just normal and natural and human to feel sadness over that loss, right? Um, it would be terrible if someone said, oh, buck up, Anne. For heaven's sakes, it's only stuff. Think of the Lord. Well, that'd be a pretty callous thing to do. She still lost all this stuff, right? But she uses this as an opportunity to say, okay, painful as this is, devastating as it is, there's something of value that can come from it. And that is, I'm going to learn something about myself. I'm going to learn something about life. I'm going to learn something about eternity. And that is, listen, in this world, you just can't hang on to things like that. You just can't. So I think it's a beautiful poem. It's a really simple poem. It's a real poem by a real woman who lost something dear to her. Um, now, you and I might say, oh, the rich lady lost all her rich stuff. Boo-hoo. Um, well, I don't think that's fair. Um, anyway, I, 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 I think everybody, whether they're rich or poor, has a human experience that's worth considering. Uh, and this certainly was one. Okay, so I wanted to touch on that and show you sort of the humanity behind that, that just because she's a really, really devoutly religious person doesn't mean she doesn't feel, doesn't mean she doesn't have human human frailty. Um, she's trying to reconcile what she's feeling with what she believes. That's really big. Okay, so hang on to that because we're going to do that with our next person, and that is Rowlandson. Rowlandson's narrative here is a fascinating piece. Now, I know it's lengthy and it's kind of involved and it's got a lot of detail in it, but hang with it, right? See it to the end. There are all these removes, which means that, that she's going to this place and into this place and into this place, right? I mean, they move a lot, okay? What draws me to this text? Well, it's more than just a tale from history, in my view. It really provides a deep insight into the human psyche. Here's one of the first things that, if you're really sharp, you think of when you read this, and that is she, of course, there's a, there's a war, Terrible atrocities are committed on both sides, frankly. It's just, just awful. I mean, the barbarity of, of all of this. Warfare is just awful anyway. She is ultimately kidnapped, along with some of her, her children, family members, brought into the wilderness. And they go deeper and deeper and deeper into the wilderness um, as they're being, in, you know, rather poorly pursued, frankly, by the settlers. Um, and this journey into the wilderness okay, is kind of mirrors or reflects a psychological journey, a spiritual, emotional journey into darkness. Remember what wilderness would have seemed like to European-descended uh, settlers. They would have seen it as a scary, dark place. You and I see the woods and we say, oh, National Park. 
fun. Let's have a picnic. That's not the way they looked at it. They looked at it, at it you know, like Dorothy did, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Um, and on top of that, people that they didn't understand who lived very differently from them that they saw as being, you know, dangerous to deal with, uh, Native Americans. So for them, the idea of going into the wilderness was a truly dark, frightening prospect. So think of the wilderness here as being metaphorical for an inner journey into the deepest, darkest recesses of her own psyche. Okay, if you can catch that, think about that. It's deep thought here, um, but that it's metaphorical and reflects that. Very interesting. That's gonna. I'm gonna take that as a premise of this text. It's really interesting for that for that uh, reason. Um, a, a surprisingly, it's also a surprisingly candid view of what it's like to be thrust into an alien culture. And by alien, I'm not saying. I'm not using that as a judgmental term. I'm saying it's just really different, a different culture, a completely different value set. Imagine that you're not just kidnapped or, 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 or taken and dropped into the middle of a different culture. But if that culture was really supremely different from your own, where the things you believed, they did not believe, the things you valued, they did not value the same way. They had a set of values and norms that you found to be just utterly incomprehensible. What is that experience like? I mean, it's one thing to be kidnapped by people who, you know, speak your language, share your particular outlook on life, um, but to be kidnapped and brought into an, it's like, it's like being transported to a different planet for her. Um, that's just very strange and very uncomfortable, to say the least, and very just terrifying. Um, and so that's one of the, these are the reasons that I'm drawn to this text because it's, it's so honest in that respect. I mean, she's very honest and forthright. At least I think she is. Some people question some things, but I don't think there's really reason to. Why isn't the text taught more widely in public schools? Well, guess what? Um, I think it would be very disruptive to our views of the Puritans. I mean, we still believe that Puritans, you know, a, you know, had big Thanksgiving dinners every year and wore these stupid black hats with buckles on them, which, by the way, they never did. We made that crap up. Um, so we have all these, these, these stereotyped vision, this vision of Puritans being a certain way, and some of those are true and some of those are not. Um, Puritans didn't weren't against sex um, or alcohol, either one, or obviously tobacco. Their biggest criticism about tobacco, as Rowlandson says, is it kind of is a, is a time waster and a nasty habit. But they believed you should drink alcohol. It was good for you to drink alcohol. Um, they believed in sex within marriage only, not outside of marriage, not adultery, obviously. But we have this idea that the Puritans didn't believe in sex or drinking or alcohol or anything. Well, where do you think the little Puritans came from, for heaven's sakes? I mean, gosh, I mean, that's just ridiculous. Um, so we have all these misconceptions. And so I think that's part of this. This, this really kind of um, blows in, away in the water some of our, our, our cherished beliefs about the Puritans. Second thing is it's kind of hard to grapple with the race-based violence. I mean, that, that's, that's probably the big thing, is we're just really uncomfortable with that because it's a thing that we still struggle with today, how to deal with that, how to address that. It just raises a lot of really uncomfortable questions. Um, and it's, it's, it's fairly complex because it forces us to deal with questions regarding the conflict of cultures and values not in a simplistic manner. I, I, I've, I've long believed that only stupid people accept simple answers, right? Intelligent people understand the complexity of what's going on. Intelligent people don't say things like, well, this group of people was wronged and this group of people was the wrongers. Well, yes, I mean, that does happen sometimes in history, but most of the time in history, it's just more complicated than that. Um, you know, uh, for example, Thomas Jefferson or George Washington, uh, were they slaveholders? Yep, that was bad. Not a good thing. But they also did great things, too, and they were great thinkers who were incredibly flawed people. Okay, so intelligent people are able to kind of assess a person, a culture, a time, uh, a work of art, and say, eh, it's got, eh, oh, this is, eh, right? Um, without, without just, you know, seeing things in completely stark, absolute terms. Um, and so that's why I like the piece, because it's really kind of morally ambiguous. Uh, ten people can approach this from ten different perspectives, and all those perspectives can be valid. Um, it's not a highly simplistic piece. Well, let's dive into a little bit of it, and I am going to make two videos out of this, I'm afraid. Um, looks like I'm going to need to, because it's quite a complex piece. A little historical background here. Um, Puritan New England and, the, and, the, and King Philip's War, because your head note doesn't really give you a lot. I'm sorry. Um, Mary White was her 
her uh, maiden name. I'm going to move myself here over to the other side so you can see my beautiful face a bit better. Um, there I am. Um, and uh, was the child of the Great Migration. The Great Migration was the group of people, thousands and thousands of people who left England in the 1630s as Puritans to settle in New England because they were being persecuted there. Okay, She left at age two, so her entire life basically was in New England. She was not an English person. Mean, she would have seen herself as English, but she was really a na almost a native of New England. Married at age 19 to Joseph, the minister, uh, a minister. Um, the family had property and and, and marriage to a minister gave her great social standing. So this is not like a lower class, working class woman. As much as, as, as possible, she was a person who was had everything going for her. She had, was kind of upper middle class, if they had class systems back then. I mean, they weren't rich by any imagination, but they were educated and they had certain social privileges, no question. She was captured in hell for three months in 1675 when King Philip's war broke out. Now, King Philip was um, the, um, or Medicom, as he really was, his real name, um, was uh, the king of a, a chief of a, of a, uh, uh, um, um, the major tribe there um, uh, that was in Massachusetts, the dominant Native American tribe there in Massachusetts. Um, the col what happened is, uh, and she died in 1711. Um, uh, and uh, after after all of this, her she she lived for a number of years. Obviously, and her husband, she and her husband relocated and became financially independent and successful as much as possible in life. But um, King Philip or Medicom. Um, uh, became upset because the colonists um, kidna uh, well I won't say kidnapped they they arrested and executed three of his warriors who allegedly murdered a praying Indian now you'll see her referring to praying Indians frequently in here a praying Indian was an Indian who had allegedly converted to Christianity so supposedly as the story goes who knows the real facts I, we never will know the facts um, three the colonists grabbed three of his warriors who had supposedly murdered a praying Indian, and they executed them. Philip becomes very enraged over this and launches attacks. You don't kill my warriors. You know, I mean, nobody seems to have cared about due process at the time. Nevertheless, this was just the last straw because there had um, um, the Narragansetts had been very, uh, that's the name of the tribe, had been very, very upset by the land grievances and all of this um, uh, while the, the col colonial militia, uh, the settlers and their allies attacked them over a broad range, uh, focusing also on the Narragansetts. Um, it really was the first full-scale ethnic conflict of its size in New England, and that, that makes it a really unpleasant and ugly kind of basis for the war. Philip is killed in the war, um, and the colonists and some Indian allies as well, um, though suffering 500 fatalities, they prevailed um, to establish dominance. And so the war basically solidified the colonists, the, the settlers, the Puritans' control over, over Massachusetts. They, they won handily. Uh, but early on in the conflict, there were a lot of bungles and bad decisions on the part of the of the of the Puritan settlers, uh, and Rowlandson raises that. Three important um, Puritan concepts that we need to know here. First, um, I'll skip to the second one, providence. We talked about providence already, right? Um, the second is the doctrine of election, which you don't have to be a theologian, but just suffice it to say that the Puritans believe very strongly that this, this age-old question, not just in Christianity, but all religions, if you believe in a God that is all-knowing, how can we also have free will? Because wouldn't an all-knowing God know where we're going to end up, heaven or hell, what kind of choices we're going to make, um, what we're going to do even before we do it? How do you reconcile God's you know, all-knowing characteristics with our own free will. How can you say we have free will if God already knows? Well, the way that the Puritans reconciled this is that God will choose to save people that he wants to save. You don't know if you're one of those people until you die, but you can see in your life signs that you may be one of those people that he's going to pick. Okay. Now, most Orthodox Christians today don't buy into that idea specifically the way I spelled it out. That's a Calvinist doctrine put forward by John Calvin that the Puritans believed in very strongly. Most Orthodox Christians today say, well, I mean, just because God knows what the end of your life will be doesn't mean you don't have choices along the way that are all yours, right? Just because you know something doesn't mean that you, you, you direct it entirely, 
right? Um, but the Calvinists, I mean, the, the Puritans would put this doctrine, this Calvinist doctrine of election along with providence and say, no, no, basically, um, you know, so, uh, you know, God knows what you're going to do. And if you're saved, it's because he directly intervened and saved you. Um, which to you and I say, well, where's the free will in that? But the Puritans reconciled it in their own minds the way they did. Like I said, most Orthodox Christians say, well, God may know the outcome of something, but he either could choose not to, 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 he could choose not to know it or could choose to say, well, now I know what the outcome is going to be, but that doesn't mean you don't have the choices. So, for example, I'll give you a very, very simplistic example. Um, my child is, is now older, but when she was little, you could put her at a table with a, with a plate full of cookies and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back in the room and you better not eat those cookies. Um, and it better not be one missing because I know how many there are. And I could leave for five or ten minutes. This would be horribly cruel with a child. Don't do it. Uh, but... You know, there are kids that you are raising or know, and you know which ones would or wouldn't do it. Okay, now that I don't know that with perfection, right? But I know that my child wouldn't have done it because that was just kind of her personality. I know other children who would have eaten a whole plate and, and lied about it, okay? <laughs> you just know because you're a parent. You know. You're just like, my child would probably probably wouldn't. Or it's like, oh yeah, he, he eat it. All right. You won't have a single cookie left if you do that for him. Um, now that's really simplistic. I'm sorry to put it at that level, but, but essentially that's kind of the idea there um, that, that, and, and if, and if I, as a human being know my child well enough to probably predict whether she would do something like that, then what, how much more would God know about us? Right. But it doesn't take away the fact that the child did it and the child has responsibility for it and all those kinds of things. Listen, it's the, one of the oldest theological questions in the world. How does an omniscient God, uh, and our free will reconcile themselves? You have to work that out on your own theologically, but you just need to know that in this text, that is a, a, a background thing because Rowlandson's going to be asking, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to me? What does it reveal? Does it mean because I was kidnapped that I was a bad person going to hell? Or does it mean because I was rescued that I am of the elect and I'm going to heaven because God wants to save me? Okay. Not just spiritually, but physically, you see. And of course, we talked about nature and nature being to them not a place of beauty and, you know, all of that sort of, I mean, they understood God's creation as being a beautiful thing, but at the same time, it was a dark and scary place for them as well. So I'm going to cut this off and then we're going to get directly into the text and hopefully I can talk about Wheatley in this next video as well. All right. So stay tuned for part two, which will come right after this.